Can you keep a secret? Changing hearts and minds. Changing. 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 You're listening to Changing Hearts and Minds, a show about reviving the warrior spirit and remembering the past to improve our future. I'm your host, Jeff Adamick. Let's get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, am I totally screwed or what? <laughs> You're funny. You're funny. I want to discuss all this behavior. Let me out of here! Would you like some nuts? No, yes, uh, um, are they warm nuts? No, uh, I believe the room temperature. Well, uh, maybe later you can come and warm up my nuts. You know, I don't really like the little ones. <laughs> what have we got here? A fucking comedian, private joker. I admire your honesty. Hell, I like you. You can come over to my house and fuck my sister. <clears throat> you little scumbag! I got your name. I got your ass. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Now get up. Get on your feet. You had best unfuck yourself or I will unscrew your head and shut down your neck. Thou shalt not kill. But hear this. Fuck that shit. Blessed be the Lord my strength that teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. My goodness, my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer. My shield, and he in whom I trust. I don't give out too many special treats. But this morning, we have a very special treat. Private Swafford here is going to play Reveille for us. Okay, Swafford, play Reveille. Oh, I don't have a bugle. You don't have, you don't have what? I don't have a bugle. Oh, no, no, no. Damn, damn. Okay. You better play it with your mouth. What? I said play it with your goddamn mouth. Sounds good to me. My morale is lifted. You know any Stevie Wonder? You know, you are the sunshine of my life. Good morning, Vietnam! Hey, this is not a test. This is rock and roll. If you ladies leave my island, if you survive recruit training, you will be a weapon. You will be a minister of death praying for war. But until that day, you are pukes. You are the lowest form of life on earth. You are not even human fucking beings. You are nothing but unorganized, grabastic pieces of amphibian shit. What's your excuse? Sir, excuse for what, sir? I'm asking the fucking questions here, Private. Do you understand? Sir, yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. Can I be in charge for a while? Sir, yes, sir. How tall are you, Private? Sir, five foot nine, sir. Five foot nine. I didn't know they stacked shit that high. Do you suck dicks? 
Sir, no, sir! Are you a Peter Pupper? Sir, no, sir! I'll bet you're the kind of guy that would fuck a person in the ass and not even have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reach around. I'll be watching you. Did your parents have any children that lived? Sir, yes, sir! I bet they regret that. <laughs> they told me that you had gone totally insane and uh, that your methods were unsound. Are my methods unsound? I don't see method at all you want to drive yourself completely nuts sit down with a veteran and watch a movie about the military you're not going to get five minutes into that movie without that veteran telling you everything that's wrong about that movie We've all done it. You guys know what I'm talking about. You turn on a movie, you start watching it, there's something wrong with the uniform. There's something wrong with the rank insignia. There's something wrong with the, with the damn tactics they're doing. There are so many different things that are wrong in movies and TV shows when the military comes, comes into the picture that most veterans only sit with other veterans to watch movies so that we can enjoy a good laugh. And very few times do we actually find movies that actually reach out and really mean something. They really find a way to inspire or show people what it's really like to be in the military. Sure, we understand that, you know, it's Hollywood, it's film, it's not supposed to be real. But that doesn't mean that when we start talking about really important things, historic events, or movies that are supposed to be telling some kind of an important point, that we don't want them to be accurate. Since the inception of Hollywood, war has been a part of movies. If you think about it, Every kind of storytelling that goes back as far as it can go back has to do with things that people want to hear about that they don't experience. And there is nothing that is more real and more invocative of the human experience than war itself. So the military has always been a part of storytelling all the way back to the days of the Iliad or the Odyssey, which are pretty much just war stories. Sure, there's a little bit of fantasy in there. You got monsters and creatures and there's love stories and everything else like that. But war is the one thing that is the most raw and the human experience brought down to its, its baseler survivalist instincts. You also have the problem of realism in movies. Hollywood always makes its money by taking things to a step further, a step higher than what they normally can be at. So enter the, la the lack of realism in film. Now, in my generation, we didn't grow up with a lot of really great war movies when I was very young. Sure, we had things like The Longest Day, Apocalypse Now. They weren't bad, but they did miss something. And then there's all those other B-rated war flicks that are just ridiculous. World War II veterans carrying M16s, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So we all see these, these issues with movies when we, were, when we were growing up, when we were watching them. We even see them nowadays sometimes. But something happened back in the mid-80s that changed everything about war movies. This movie called Platoon came out. And for the first time ever, there wasn't a person alive that had a thing to say about the military depictions in the movie. Sure, it deals with some harsh topics, but that's war. What I'm talking about is the realism, the interaction between the soldiers with the situation they were in and how they acted on screen. When you can do something like that, the small things like what uniform they're wearing or what small little thing here or you know, where the awards are in their uniforms, all that stuff seems to fade away when you actually get to the point where the characters are acting like military men act. There's somebody that actually had everything to do with that. And since Platoon, that individual has been a part of almost every movie and film or honored for being accurate and being real. Talking about Mr. Dale Dye. Dale Dye is from Missouri and he enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps in 1964. His unit was one of the very first to deploy to Vietnam in 1965. He saw quite a bit of combat action during his tours in Vietnam, but he also rose from an enlisted Marine 
to an NCO, to a warrant officer, and eventually was commissioned as an officer. He would serve as a captain in the Marines before retiring in 1984. Once he got out, guys, he started Warriors, Inc., which is a company that I'm going to actually read you guys directly from the website what Warriors, Inc. was about. Captain Dale Dye came to Hollywood with a vision. He had a single mission in mind, to change how American civilians viewed the common grunt. Having been around infantrymen all his life and having been one himself, he knew that the majority are intelligent, creative, and full of heart, and that the image of the dumb cannon fodder blindly following orders not only was not true, but it was a great disservice to those brave servicemen who had risked and often gave their lives so that our nation could survive and prosper. He, guys, today, Dale Dye is one of the most recognizable names and faces in film and television. When it comes to accurate and inspiring combat and military stories, he's the guy that we always think of. He's a favorite to all veterans who always can spot his influence on the projects he's a part of. From Platoon to Saving Private Ryan and TV shows Band of Brothers in the Pacific, each of which is commonly known to be a favorite among veterans for its realism and ability to capture the heart and culture of grunts in combat. Dale Dye served in the Vietnam War and the Lebanese Civil War and has been awarded the Bronze Star Medal with V-Device for Valor, three Purple Hearts, two Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medals with V-Device, Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal with V-Device, Matoria Service Medal, and the Joint Service Commendation Medal. Welcome to the show, Mr. Dale Dye. Well, Thank you, Jeff. I, I don't know what, whether to go to sleep or stand up and salute here. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. That's great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. No, well, thank, thank you. First of all, thank you for your service and for, honest to God, for being, being a guy that actually went to Hollywood. And in, in my opinion, and a lot of opinions of, of guys like me, changed the way that, mil, that film and television made combat stories to actually be consumable by the actual veterans who had seen combat. So, uh, we we're, were just ha- we're just very happy to have you on. And uh... well, that that whole that whole thing, Jeff, was was entirely the mission. I mean, I had no idea, frankly, um, how hard it was going to be or what kind of resistance I was going to uh, encounter. But that was the agenda, and it it was the agenda when I started, um, and it it remains the agenda today. I just think that Hollywood needs to recognize and do better by. Uh, those of us who've, uh, who've worn the uniform and borne the burden of, uh, of war. Um, and, and as I can get that done, I'm, I'm delighted. Uh, I can't always get it done, but I'm, I'm batting pretty good um, with things like Band of Brothers and Saving Private Ryan and, and some of the ones you mentioned. So I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be with you, and you can ask me anything, and I'll try to answer for you. Can you talk to us about your method of preparing the cast for playing the soldiers uh, through Warriors, Inc. and what you guys do? Sure. Um, look, a long time ago, um, you know, I had I had watched every I think every military movie there ever was, Jeff. And and uh, it, they were always missing something from the simplest, stupid mistakes like carrying, you know, an M-16 rifle in a World War Two movie. Um, to more complicated things like like how we talk to each other and how we relate to each other, and I I, I kept seeing the the um, you know the the title in the credits technical advisor and it'd be some retired guy and 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 I said well you know how in the hell did he let stuff like that get by what's going on so I, I came to Hollywood to to try to figure out what the gap was, and I very quickly found out that. Um, the, the Hollywood establishment, and, you know, very, very few of them ever wore a uniform or, for that matter, knew anybody who ever wore a uniform. And so uh, they didn't consider things about our heart and our mind, who we were, as important parts of the dramatic storytelling process. They just wanted to know, you know, is this uniform right? And now get away and go over there and sit down and go to sleep and we'll wake you up and we want to know which side the ribbons go on. <laughs> right, right. Um so I said, well, you know, no wonder, no wonder. So I began to, I, I said, this has to be fixed. And, and as I moved along, I began to meet a few actors, people who, who really were into the process and who were creative, artistic type of people. And I said, how can you, how can you guys screw it up so bad? <laughs> and they said, they said, what do you mean? Uh, we had a we had a guy told us how to carry the weapon and how to wear our gear. And I said, yeah, but that's not it. What you're missing is the heart and soul of a soldier. 
of who we are, how we relate to each other, how we talk, how we carry ourselves, uh, how we think, what our passions are, uh, how we rely on the guy to our right and our left. And, and we must have faith that he's relying on us. We're relying on him and, and he won't let us down. Um, and, and they, they just looked at me, you know, with a kind of a blank expression, like, huh? Um, and I said, no, 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 that's really the essence. That's the soul of it. And so I began to think it over and I said, well, look, how can I fix this? Assuming I ever get a chance, which I finally did in platoon, how can I fix this? And the answer was very simple. And every GI, every soldier, every Marine, every sailor, every airman, every Coast Guardsman will recognize the answer immediately, and that's training. But you have to do this training in extremis. They're not going to give me six, eight, ten weeks to train these guys as, uh, as we would do on an entry level in one of the services. Right. I've, I've got to find a way to take five or six days or two weeks or one week or whatever they'll give me. And I have to teach these guys how we think, how we act, how we relate to each other. And, and so what occurred to me was, look, if, if I'm forced to do that in that brief period of time, then I've got to cut away all of the crapola. I've got to put these guys in extremis. I've got to make them experience some of the things that we experience, things like utter exhaustion, um, things like no sleep, things like having to protect the next guy while he sleeps, um, things about what's, what it's really like to carry heavy weight and hump hills. Uh, you know, I've ha I had enough of this business of, you know, having styrofoam in the pack. That's right. not going to work with me. I don't play that game. <laughs> so I developed this, what, what people call the, the captain die method, which is I'm going to take your dumb ass and I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to PT you or whatever else I can do until you're dragon. I'm going to smoke you. And then I probably have your attention. At that point, you're probably thinking all I really need to do is not piss off that old white haired guy. <laughs> and if I can, if I can just do that, I'll get through this. What they didn't understand and what I understood from my own personal experience was once I've got them at that point, they're dry sponges. I can now teach, and I can not only teach academically, but I can teach psychologically. I can teach emotionally because now they will understand it. They will understand how we live and the hardships with, up with which we have to put. And so what, what happened is there was this Captain Die method that developed, and it began with a platoon in which they gave me uh, 33 actors, and I took them into the, the jungles of the Philippines, the mountains of the Philippines up above Luzon, uh, on the north um, or yeah northwest uh, portion of Luzon, up in the jungle mountains, and and I made them live as we lived in Vietnam for three weeks, and of course you know that that show won um, four Academy Awards, including Best Picture. And I was fortunate enough to be recognized as a big part of that, a big part of what it made, what made it such a great movie. Right, right. And and so uh, I began to to I will get around to answering your question. Oh no, you're fine. Um, fine, take your time, sir. I I began to um, to tweak and to change and to modify and to improve that method so that I could do it even better in an even briefer period of time. Um, and by the time we got to Band of Brothers, um, I recognized that I had the way to do this. And so Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks called me in and they said, Dale, you know, we want you to do this. We want you to do what you normally do. But what do you need? And I said, I want, because these guys are seen from their very formation." Easy Company 506, first of the 506, 101st Airborne Division in World War II. They're given, we see them from the time they assemble, from the time they go into basic training, all the way toward the end of the war. 
And so I said, I need to replicate that experience in some fashion. And I said, I, I want two weeks and I'll take them by the time I graduate them, by the time I bring them out, they will know what it was like to be a young paratrooper soldier um, in World War II. And so I designed this program that began with a, uh, a long series of living in the barracks at, uh, and actually I used a barracks uh, because that's what they would have used um, at Tekoa right. uh, when they were originally formed um, at a place called Longmore Camp, which is very near Aldershot, which is the home of the British Army. And I was completely isolated. There was a fence around the area, completely isolated. Um, they had to, I had our own cooks and we fed them um, and we PT'd every morning. Uh, we humped hard all the time. We worked at night uh, so that they would get used to that. And what happened is they began to gel. They began to know each other. They began to become a paratrooper rifle company circa 1944. With you, you had already you had already gone through this with with Tom Hanks in Saving Private Ryan, um, right? So he he had seen the benefit firsthand, uh, much much like a guy who you know they see they see basic training at, on TV or or any of the different versions of it, and they're like, I don't sure. understand what's the necessity of being of being treated so poorly and being being yelled at and everything. And it's not until and sometimes I think not until you become an NCO in the military do you realize <laughs> the importance of that type of training as far sure. as building a team. And bringing guys together, and like you said, you break them down to their to their base survivalist instincts, right. and then lowest you've common got denominator. Them, yeah, and you've yeah. got them then to to build them up from that point, and they build up together as a team, and that building as a team does really make them the same. And I I think where you go, you get you get it right the most is, is that whole attitude of they these are those guys because anybody that goes through that and and they go through that as a as a group together, they always come out the other side. Uh, we sure, talk, I mean. Look, the, the, and I, sorry to interrupt you, but no, go ahead. The, the idea is basically this. I recognize that, you know, you can train anybody to walk and act like a soldier. But the real magic is in understanding the heart and the mind of that soldier and how he reacts and why he reacts. And, and how, how you relate to each other and how you, how you rely on each other. And so that was, that was, if there's any magic to it, it was that. I, I wanted to get beyond the exterior. I wanted to get into their head and into their guts where emotion lives, um, into their hearts where spirit lives. Uh, and those are all, um, you know, warm and fuzzy touchy feely words, but that's the real deal. Right. Right. And that's what, that's what makes a veteran. That's what makes a soldier of any ilk of any uniform, uh, different than anybody else in the world because they understand that. So it's much, it's much like, it's much like the same type of, um, isolation based, uh, unit cohesion training that we ourselves have been through, whether it's basic training uh, boot camp, ranger school, that kind of stuff. And to me, that's, that's, that's what it reminds me of the most is, is like a small ranger school for these guys where they build yeah. up from being nobody to being the leader of these patrols. That's a good example. Yeah. It's fantastic. It, it really is. It's, it's, it's remarkable that, uh, it, it's such a, it's such a basic idea that I think is it, probably, you probably think of the same thing I have is like, why did nobody f figure this out earlier? You know, well, they were afraid of Hollywood hubris. There were there were two elements. You want me to talk about that for a please, little bit? Please go right ahead. I'd love to hear it. All right. When when I first came to Hollywood and I said, "Look, I'm I'm a creative guy. I'm a storyteller. I know how to do this." They said, "Well, that's impossible. You couldn't be nobody who wore a uniform who was in the military. They you don't go in the military if you're a creative person, if you're right. a filmmaker. Right. You know, and and that's what I faced. They actually believed that, the establishment out here. So first of all, I had to prove that I was indeed that sort of creative person. Right. Uh, that, that was one thing. And the other thing was that they didn't think anybody in the audience cared. You know, so what? Nobody's going to know if that's the right weapon or not. Hey, who cares? <laughs> Just it, it shoots, right? Get it out there. Right. And I said, guys, not only are you talking to a batch 
of, you know, a generation of Vietnam guys who do know. But you're talking to people who are who are tied into their their media saturated. They know these things. You can't make the presumption that nobody gives a crap. Right. They do. And the details are important. So, so it was those two battles that I had to defeat. But those two problems were the reason that nobody had done it before I did it, because everybody would look at that and simply say, well, OK, I guess that's the way it is in Hollywood. Well, I said horseshit. Excuse my language. <laughs> no, no. I we're, said, we're an explicit show, sir. You're, you're well, 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 just go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm not buying that and I don't quit. I'm not a quitter. Uh, I will take this objective. And so in spite of all of those roadblocks and in spite of all of those problems, I just kept at it. I fixed bayonets and went at it. Right. Um, And I got that one break. And that one break was an Academy Award winner. And nothing succeeds in Hollywood like success. I didn't see anything, sir. I did. That dink was reported to me as NBA by Sergeant Barnes, sir. My report, sir, will include Lieutenant Wolf as being witness to the shooting. All right, lass. Staff Sergeant Barnes? Sir! I want a full report from you on this when we get back to the CP. You got it, Diawe, and I can throw in plenty of eyewitnesses if you want, sir. Not now, goddammit. Not now. We'll get into this when we get back to the base camp, and I can promise you something. If I find out there was an illegal killing, there will be a court-martial. Right now, I need every man in the field, and you two will cease fire. Staff Sergeant Barnes, Sergeant Elias, you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, we're going back into that NVA bunker complex tomorrow, this time from the east. You people get some rest, and be back up here at the CP at 1900 for a briefing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do, do you do you think, and this, this is a question on, on that one question, do you think that that uh, Oliver Stone's experiences in the military and the fact that he was actually a soldier himself, do you think that helped along with him giving you that opportunity where he maybe kind of knew already what, that you were saying that you were saying the truth? Oh, he did. He did. Absolutely. He, he the minute I pitched it to him that this is what I wanted to do, that I wanted them to live in the jungle like we lived in the jungle. He got it immediately. Right. He said, yeah, that's that's probably right. That's probably the only way they'll really understand this. Uh, and remember, in in those days, these guys, the guys we had, uh, Charlie Sheen, Forrest Whitaker, um, Tom Berenger, Willem Dafoe, Johnny Depp, um, they weren't they weren't major names at that point. Right. And so, uh, you know, he said, yeah, they're they're going to need they're going to need to understand who we were in order to understand this script and how to tell this story. So, yeah, absolutely. He got it. And and the reason he got it is because he had been through it. Right. And then having said that, uh, for the for the people listening, it is it is the same the other way around. Um, As you guys who have been listening to my show for a long time know, I went to a performing arts high school in New Jersey. I tried out for Juilliard. Uh, things didn't work out. I had to pay for college. I joined the Army, went from the 82nd Airborne Division to 2nd Ranger Battalion, and the number one thing I always ran into was, you did what in high school? How could you, yeah, right. who wanted to be an actor and be a singer, <laughs> end up in one of the most elite units in the military? And it's, it was always a source of poking fun at me all the yeah. time. And it was okay for me. I understood that, that my heart and my soul were in the military regardless of what of what chosen profession I had wanted to do when I was younger but it's it's the same thing it goes back it's both both cultures are just as guilty as of not understanding each other as one and the other is yeah so yeah. and and frankly they're they're unwilling sometimes to take that one step forward or back that it it's all it takes to understand but yeah you're right it's the obverse of what I was running into out here I call it hollywood hubris but you could call it ranger hubris right a couple weeks ago, I was having a meeting with, with the other host from the from Changer POV podcast, and we were talking about new ideas and stuff to come up with. I think it was Dwayne France who said to me, why don't you do a show on Band of Brothers? Well, I took that idea and I put it into, I made it grow into a larger idea. I said, why not just do one show? Why don't I put together a series of shows that can be run almost like a companion piece to Band of Brothers? That's where I came up with the idea of this project that's going to be coming out in January called Lessons in Leadership, Band of Brothers. 
myself, and some other hosts are going to go dig deep down inside the history and the men of Easy Company. And we're going to bring you a companion piece to the actual series where you're going to get a episode of Changing Hearts and Minds for every single one of the episodes of Band of Brothers. They're all going to be released at the same time. You're going to be able to access them. There'll be a separate project. It'll be Changing Hearts and Minds and Change Your POV Presents Lessons in Leadership, the Band of Brothers. I went out then I tried to find as many people that I could who were veterans, podcast hosts, to be a part of this project. When I did that, I also went out and tried to seek down some of the people I had to do with the production of the actual miniseries on HBO. I was lucky enough to get a response. There's a lot more to this interview, but what I wanted to give you guys today was a little bit of a piece of the interview that I had with Mr. Dale Dye. Give you a little taste of what you're going to get in January when you guys get the Band of Brothers release. Change your POV and all of its shows can help and heal and even educate. We want you to help us help others. Visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash change your POV. Become a patron of our network and our mission.